are in week two of a series that we're doing on the story of Gideon, this man named Gideon from the book of Judges. And um, before we go any further, I'm actually going to read a little bit more as if I didn't give Ruth enough to read. Um, <laughs> I think there was a, a little mix-up because we ended before I wanted it to end. So I have to find out where we are first. Um, what verse did we end at? Okay. Um, so he breaks down the altar of, of Baal and the men are coming in and looking for him and his dad supports him. And then in verse 32 it says, So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar... They gave him the name Jeru Jerubbaal saying, that day, saying, let Baal contend with him. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizarites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet them. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all of the ground is dry, then I will know that you, it, that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. Now, we're looking at this man named Gideon, um, and we're going to do this series for a, a few more weeks. Last week was when we started. If you missed last week, I would encourage you to uh, head to the website, and you can check out the video message there. But let's pray as we get started. God, this morning as we take a look at this man, Gideon, and we see how you used him to do the impossible, help us to understand that, that you desire to use us as well, and, and not to use us just for these mundane tasks in life, but you desire to use us to do amazing things for your kingdom. Help us to be open, God, to trusting you to do the incredible through us pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week when we first started looking at Gideon, we learned that Gideon is an Israelite, and the Israelites were the chosen people of God. So he's, he's one of, of the chosen people, but the Israelites at the time that we meet Gideon are being oppressed by a group of people called the Midianites, among many, but the Midianites were the main ones. Now, the reason that this is happening to the Israelites, the reason that the, the Midianites are oppressing God's chosen people is because Gideon and his people have rejected God's ways. We talked last week that, that this happens over and over and over again in the Old Testament. We see this thing that's, that's labeled the redemption cycle by a lot of biblical scholars. And what the redemption cycle was, was this kind of vicious cycle that the Israelites, the chosen people of God, kept going through. And it, and it looked like this. So the Israelites, God's people, they would reject God's ways, and then they would experience the decline of the chosen people, and then God would allow consequences in the lives of the Israelites, and then there would be a restored relationship with God, and then the cycle would start over. And this happens over and over and over again in the Old Testament. The Israelites didn't learn their lessons very quickly. They would reject God's ways they would decline in stature and people would oppress them. And then there would be these consequences they had to deal with. Some of them were extremely harsh, like the ones that Gideon and his people are going through at this point. And then there'd be this restored relationship. So over and over and over again. Now, because of this oppression that they're, that they're under from the Midianites, Gideon is in hiding when our story starts. And we, we saw him in hiding last week, hiding in a, a wine press tr trying to thresh wheat, not where he should have been. And while he's in hiding, an angel appears to him. And we learned last week that this angel, the, the actual termino the terminology used in Judges is that this angel is identified as the eternal, pre-existent Christ. So to try and put all of last week into a recap really quickly, the angel that meets Gideon, he tells him that, that he's going to defeat. He says, the angel says to Gideon, you're going to defeat the Midianites. And this is something that Gideon knows is completely impossible in his own strength. 
And so that's where we picked up the story today. Now, I had a lot of that read. Um, Ruth, you did a wonderful job reading a long passage of Scripture, and then I came up and said that wasn't enough, so I read more. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of walk through this section of the, the story of Gideon, and, uh, and I want to do that so that I make sure that we don't miss some of the really good stuff that's in here. So this is kind of the Steve version of everything that we just read. So today's reading started right after Gideon has been told that God is going to use him to defeat what Gideon thinks is an undefeatable enemy. So Gideon, at this point, he basically says, well, okay, that sounds great. Um, I would love to defeat the Midianites because they keep coming, especially every time our crops are ready. They come and invade and they take everything. So I'm tired of the Midianites stealing everything we have, so this sounds good. I like this plan that we're going to defeat them. But first, I need to make sure that this is really happening. I need to make sure that I'm really talking to this angel of the Lord um, because this is a little bit crazy. I know that I can't defeat them. Sounds good, but I'm not sure that I believe everything yet. So he actually asks right at the beginning of our reading today, he asks this angel of the Lord, he says, I need a sign so that I will know that this truly is the Lord who is speaking to me, telling me that I'm going to defeat the Midianites. So he asks the angel of the Lord to sit tight. Can you just stay here? I'm going to go off and prepare an offering for you. Now, when we read that, we're like, okay, he's going to prepare an offering. He has to go get a goat, kill a goat, prepare a goat. He's got the broth. He's making bread, right? This is not like 20 minutes. He's got to go find his checkbook and write an offering. This is something that takes quite a while. And so the angel of the Lord says, go ahead. I'll wait here. So he goes and prepares this offering. And it says there's a goat, some bread and broth. He brings it back to the angel finally when he's prepared it. And he sets it on a rock. And then the angel of the Lord touches the offering with his staff. Now remember, it's on a rock. And the whole thing catches fire and it's consumed in a blaze. I don't know when the last time you saw a flaming rock was. But Gideon sees this offering go up in flames. And as he's staring at the offering being consumed, the angel disappears. And here's what happens next. In Judges chapter 6, 22 and 23, it says, when Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. Now, if we're not careful here, this can be one of those passages of Scripture that we just sort of cruise right by, missing some really important stuff. If we just read it, my Bible says it like this, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. doesn't seem like that big a deal, but it's the response of this angel of the Lord that is really telling here, because the Lord responds, peace, do not be afraid, you're not going to die. Now, we know that Gideon has to be reassured at this point that he's not going to die. And so if we understand that, that Gideon had to be reassured that he's not going to die, we could reread Gideon's response a little more accurately. Instead of this kind of Shakespeare in the park, alas, sovereign Lord, I've seen the Lord face to face, right? Instead of that, it would be something more like, ah! I've seen the face of the Lord. I'm going to die. Yep, I'm going to die. I'm gone, right? I'm toast. You see, because they didn't think that they could see the Lord. If you remember the story of Moses, Moses wasn't even allowed to see the Lord. God allowed him to see his back as he walked away. And so the Israelites are thinking, and, and Gideon's an Israelite, and he's got to be thinking, I just saw the Lord. Of course the next thing is I'm going to die. But the angel says, peace, relax, you're not going to die. So clearly now, based on Gideon's reaction, this fear that he's actually going to die, he knows that this is the Lord. He's asked for this sign. Please, you know, show me who you are, make sure that I understand this. And the Lord is, is, is making it very clear that it, it's him that he's talking to. The Lord has now promised to use Gideon to defeat the Midianites. So like any good Israelite at, the, at this time, Gideon, he builds an altar right there and right then to the Lord. And the, he, he does this in order to demonstrate this new understanding of his, and he wants to mark this occasion for him and for future generations. 
that this was the time that the Lord appeared to Gideon and to the Israelites. Now, on the same night that he builds an altar, the Lord says to him, hey, that's great. I appreciate the altar. That's a good thing. But what I really need you to do now is I need you to go tear down the altar that your dad made. Uh Uh-oh. I don't know how many of you have ever gone against your parents' wishes. Remember that the Israelites were in this predicament because they had started worshiping other gods. Now, Gideon's dad was worshiping them too. But he wasn't just worshiping other gods. He's building altars to other gods. In Judges 6.27, it says, So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than the daytime. Did you catch that? He's convinced now this is the Lord, right? Or he wouldn't have thought he was going to die. But then he's told to go do something. He's still afraid. Even though Gideon's completely convinced this is the Lord who's talking to him, in verse 27 it says, but because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Now, it's understandable that Gideon is afraid because Scripture tells us that in the morning when the town wakes up and they all realize that Gideon has, well, that somebody has torn down the altar to Baal, they they want to investigate. we got to find out who this was, and then what do they want to do when they find out who it is? They want to kill him. They said, let's find out who did this, and let's kill them. So he has reason to, to be afraid of the townspeople. Now, thankfully, Gideon's father, who is one of those that Gideon is afraid of, because it's his dad's altar that, that he's actually tearing down, Gideon's father comes to his defense, and he says, look, townspeople, If Baal, that we built this altar to, really is a god, then he can defend himself. We don't need to defend him. So now Gideon is beginning to see God's strength working through his weakness. Now it's interesting, right at this time that he's torn down the altar, now he's starting to see, like, okay, God's telling me to do this, I'm doing it, I'm still okay, my dad even supported me, Baal didn't come and attack me, so this is good. Right at this time, though, the Midianites and some other horrible people along with the Midianites, they invade the land of the Israelites again. Gideon must be starting to feel some confidence now because as the enemy has come back into the land and they've been oppressed for years and years and years, Gideon, he blows the trumpet and he first calls his clan to arms. And then he calls not just his family clan, but he calls his tribe, one of the, just one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he calls three other tribes of Israel. And they all respond. They all come to the defense of the country. And so now Gideon has four of the 12 tribes of Israel who have rallied to his side to defend God's chosen people from the bad guys. Gideon's finally getting it. He knows that the Lord is with him. He's fully trusting God to do the impossible through him. Right? Nope. He says, okay, God, if you're, if you're really going to do what you've promised, uh, then I'm going to lay a fleece, uh, basically a big piece of wool. I'm going to lay it outside on the ground tonight, and when I wake up early in the morning, if you could have just the fleece, just the wool be all wet and the ground dry, then I'll know that it's you. Now, I have, to, I have to kind of wonder at this point what God is thinking um, of Gideon, who he's chosen uh, to do this, because Gideon keeps asking for sign after sign, but, but God goes ahead and God does this. So Gideon wakes up in the morning, the ground is dry, and the fleece is wet. It's so wet it says he can wring out a bowl full of water from it. Okay, so finally now, after this sign, Gideon is trusting, and he's ready to go. Nope. Here's what happens in verse 38. So it says, and this is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day, and he squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew a bowl full of water. So the first sign he's asked for has come true. And Gideon continues, it says, Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me, but let me just make one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. But this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. And that night God did so. Only the fleece was dry, all the ground was covered with dew. It's sort of, when I read this, it's sort of like Gideon questions himself. He thinks, you know, that sign that I asked for was kind of too easy 
for God? Because, you know, it's possible, based on science and the meteorology that they really didn't understand, but now we think we're smart and we understand it, right? That I could put a piece of wool out and the dew could come all over the ground and maybe I just slept in a little too long and the sun dried the dew on the ground, but it hadn't quite dried the fleece yet. That's what I think he's almost, at this point, he's kind of, ah, that was too easy for God. Like, I got to give him something else to prove himself. So then he says to God, do it the other way. Because there's no way, like that's not, I, even if I sleep in too long, if the, if the ground is wet, but the fleece is dry, then I'll really know that it's you. And guess what? The Lord does it. So now that we've worked our way through that long passage and all of these little components, and we've done it in the Steve version, um, I want to highlight a few things that I think are really important lessons for us to consider as we study Gideon's life and as we try and figure out what does this mean for us and how is it that we can trust God to use us for incredible things. As we began, we learned that, that God wants to use us for some things that we probably can't even imagine. I guarantee you Gideon, while he's hiding in the wine press, didn't think that he was going to be used to free the Israelites from the oppression. So here's some things that, that we need to remember Things that, that we think are impossible a lot of times aren't going to be impossible if we can remember these three things. So, I don't know about you, but I want God to trust me. I want to be able to trust God. I want him to use me to do the impossible. And so the first thing that I think we need to understand from this passage, the first thing that we get from Gideon's story here is that we need to have the right perspective. We, as believers, need to have the right perspective. And we see that Gideon actually gains the right perspective after he brings that first offering, the one that we talked about with the goat and the bread and he puts it on the rock. He starts to gain some perspective when he's, he sees that it's consumed by the fire and then he realizes in that moment, oh, this isn't just like a prophet, it's not just an angel, this is the Lord that I'm talking to, right? You remember, he thought he was going to die because he'd seen the Lord. So now he's starting to to be afraid. He's starting to have this perspective that this is the angel of the Lord. Now that idea of Gideon being afraid, afraid that he was going to die, a lot of times as Christians we like to whitewash this idea of being afraid when we talk about God. But Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Gideon has just gained some wisdom. He saw the Lord and now he has an understanding of what the consequences of seeing God could be. See, a lot of us today, we, we try to kind of explain this concept of fearing God as, as something like, well, it's, it, it means having a great respect or, or having an awe for God. And, and I think it does, it, it, and we should have great respect, and we should have an awe for God. But I think that there's, there's a true fear that comes when, when we understand who God is and who we are. When we start to grasp the gap between our strength and our power and the strength and the power of God. How many of you have, have seen the, the staged car accidents that they, they used to put? I don't know if they do it anymore. They put them at schools like right before prom week to try and remind students to, to be responsible. Um, now, nowadays, there's these TV commercials where they show kids texting while they're driving, and then out of nowhere, they get blindsided by like a dump truck, and it's just, it's a horrific accident. It's meant to, to show the power and the destruction of these cars, and it's really meant to give us a proper fear of what can happen when we're not being responsible. It's, it's supposed to scare us into driving more safely. Now, we read last week that, that God said to Gideon, I am with you. Now that Gideon's starting to have a proper understanding, a proper perspective of who God is, and a proper fear of God, he's starting to understand that, well, if I, if I have the proper fear of God, then I don't have anything else in this world to fear. Now, I said he's starting to understand the fear of God because now we see God giving Gideon his next assignment. And that's going to require some more trust on Gideon's part, some more trust in God, because he tells Gideon to destroy that altar that his dad built to a false god. And Gideon obeys. Now, he does tear down the altar, but it also told us that he did it at night because 
He was afraid. He's afraid of what his father's going to do, and he's definitely afraid of what the townspeople are going to do. But the important thing for us this morning as we're looking at this is that he obeyed even in the midst of fear. And we need to do the same thing. We need to obey in the midst of fear. You see, Gideon was afraid of the human response to his obedience to God. Now that he has a proper perspective, that that perspective that comes from a healthy and correct fear of the Lord, then he's able to obey even where there may be very real and difficult consequences for us to face in this life. And he's able to obey because he now knows God is with him. This is God. And he said, I will be with you. Gideon was commanded to destroy this altar to a false god, which in his culture that, that carried with it some serious consequences because the, the scripture tells us that when the townspeople found out, they were trying to find out who it was so they could put him to death. So we know the consequences, the, the, the human response, the human consequences were real, and that's what Gideon was afraid of. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Gideon was still afraid. It says so very clearly in Scripture. He was afraid of the very real outcome of tearing down that altar. The very real outcome of tearing down that altar was that he might be killed. But because he's learning to do what 2 Corinthians 14 says, to fix his eyes on the Lord, he's able to obey in the midst of a very real fear. Now, right after this, we find that the Midianites are invading again. And so Gideon puts out this call to arms, and, and people respond. And so when, when the people respond, he's again needing reassurance. Now he's, he's sounded the trumpet, right? Okay, God's told me that we're going to defeat the Midianites. He's going to use me to do it. Here they come again. I'm blowing the trumpet. And all of a sudden, everybody actually shows up. And I wonder if at this point Gideon's thinking, oh, great. See, I, I blew the trumpet. Everybody came to fight. And if I'm wrong, if this isn't all really happening the way that I think it's happening, I'm going to get everybody killed. And so he asks for another sign. Now, God gives him the sign that he asked for by wetting the fleece, but that's not good enough for Gideon. He tries to explain away this miracle that he asked for by thinking that, that it was possible even without God. Gideon's putting God in a box. He's putting him in, in his limited box of, of human understanding. And so this third thing for us that we need to consider when we think about God using us to do the impossible is that, that we can't put God in a box. Don't put God in a box. Gideon has now seen multiple ways that the Lord is speaking to him and that the Lord is working through him. And it's like he's still trying to explain away all of these experiences that he's had. I think it's, it's human nature for us to try and explain things away. We, we love to try and explain miracles by saying, well, scientifically, if, if we really think about it, these things could have happened. Now, I'm not, I'm not bagging on science too much. I just happen to think that science is really the study of what God's already done. We, we learn about what he's done in, in science. So I'm not bagging on science, but I think sometimes that we try and, and take these incredible things that we see God doing, and we try and explain them in ways that take the supernatural, the miraculous, away from God. And Gideon is still obviously struggling with this very realness of God when he asks for it, and God gives it to him, and now he's think, thinking to himself, man, this, the enormity of the task that's in front of me. I'm going to take our people, and we're going to go fight the Midianites. This task is way too big for him. You know, I don't think we're much different when we try to kind of rationalize God. We try and put God into our human finite box. But as we read scripture, we see these miracles that Jesus did. And we think to ourselves, oh man, that's great. Jesus is awesome. But John chapter 14 verse 12 tells me this. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Jesus is the one who's speaking there. And so Jesus is actually, he's telling his disciples at this point that even though you've seen me feed the 5,000, 
You've seen me cast out demons. You've seen me heal people who've been blind, deaf, lame, whatever, since birth. You've seen me raise people from the dead. Now he's telling his disciples, now even though you've seen all that, you are going to do even more. You are going to do even greater things than that. And we're going to see how God uses Gideon to do the impossible. He uses Gideon to do something that he never could have done in his own strength. And if, if we're willing to stop trying to put God in our finite little human boxes, we'll see him do some incredible things through us as well. You see, I think God clearly had some big plans for Gideon because we can read that and we will as we move forward in the story. But God has some big plans for you as well. God has some big plans for this church. Plans that, that there's no way we could ever accomplish on our own in our strength. But see, we have to trust him. That's what God keeps asking us to do. Trust me to work through you. We need to have the right perspective of who God is and who we are. We need to be able to obey even in the midst of fear. And we need to let God be God in our lives. We need to stop trying to fit him in our box. And it's when Gideon does these things that God is glorified through him. And it's when we do these things that God will be glorified through us. Let's pray.